Hello there. Let me give you a quick summary of what we have achieved so far. In the last few videos we learned about normal subgroups, what they are, and that taking the quotient by a normal subgroup gives me another group. Now I'm trying to convince you why it should be worthwhile to do that. Why the concept of factoring out a group should be helpful at all. So first of all, as we have seen in one of the last videos, sometimes when you have a non-trivial normal subgroup of a group G, then it's possible to break down the group itself into smaller pieces, namely this normal subgroup and the direct product of the quotient of G by this normal subgroup. If you remember, we talked about this example here, that Z sub 6 can be written as Z2 times Z6 modulo C2, which is nothing but C3. So if we have information about the smaller pieces, then by isomorphism, I also have information about the group itself. This is one of the reasons why taking quotient groups might be helpful. Of course, in this example, it's not very helpful because both sides are kind of trivial or small groups. But if you have a larger group and you know that this is the direct product of this normal subgroup and its quotient, then you have a better chance to understand the whole group by looking at these two smaller pieces. This is one argument why factor groups or quotient groups might be helpful for the understanding of, of groups. Then, as a second reason, there are some propositions of the following sort. If I have a normal subgroup that is POFL, this does not mean anything, it just stands for some um, property of the normal subgroup. So if I know that the normal subgroup satisfies this here and the quotient satisfies this, then I can infer that G itself has the property of being POFL, whatever that may mean. Let me give you an example. If POFL means being finitely generated, which means that G can be written as the group generated by a finite number of its elements. Of course, in our study of mostly finite groups, this is not very interesting because every finite group certainly is finitely generated. You can just take all of the elements of G, then this of course is true. But it's more interesting when you study infinite groups to find a finite set of generators. So this concept is mainly important for infinite groups. There is a proposition that says if a normal subgroup of a group G is finitely generated and the quotient G mod n is also finitely generated, then G itself is already finitely generated. Actually, we would be in a position to prove this. This is not too hard and we can do it with our little machinery that we have developed so far. But the proof, as always, when we talk about um, the subgroups generated by some elements is rather technical, so I'll omit it. But this is a nice example for what I mean here. Or there are propositions of the following form. If the quotient of a group by a normal subgroup has some property being poffel, whatever that means, then G must already be poffel waffle, which might be another property. There are also um, propositions like that. So if I have knowledge of the factor group, then I can directly infer something about the group itself. These are all reasons why it is worthwhile to study quotient groups. All right, now we take a look at a very important subgroup of any group. This will play an important role if we ever get to solvability of algebraic equations. If we get that far, then this here, or the so-called derived series, will be playing an important role. I don't know yet, but still, even if we don't get that far in our course, it's important that you have heard of the so-called commutator subgroup of a group. So as always, G is a group, and then we define the commutator of two elements of this group to be this expression here, and be abbreviated by that. 
these brackets here, xy bracket xy. I'm not sure if this is the correct um, expression, but um, I don't know. So this here is defined as xy and then x inverse y inverse. And the commutator subgroup of this group G is the subgroup generated by all the commutators. So I take all the commutators, put them in a set, and then I take the smallest subgroup containing all the commutators, which is exactly this, what is being written here, the subgroup generated by all the commutators. To be a little bit, to be a little bit more exact, I should put um, set brackets around these, but I think it is clear what is meant by that. One notation for this commutator subgroup is obviously gg in these brackets. Another expression that is used is g prime, the so-called derived subgroup. Unfortunately, I do not know what this has to do with the derivative from calculus prime. I think there must be some reason. As I've hinted at before, there is a so-called derived series of these iterated commutator subgroups, but I don't know where this um, prime here comes from or if there's any connection to the derivative of calculus. If you know, please drop a comment and let me know. So what is the relevance of this commutator subgroup? Well, it measures exactly how non-commutative the group is in the following sense, or we can say it like that. The larger this group here is, the further away the group itself is from being abelian. Why? Because obviously this here is true, because if I plug in this definition, then y inverse cancels and then x inverse cancels with this x here and I'm left with xy. So when do two elements of the group commute? So when is xy the same as yx? Well, using this relation here, obviously, if and only if the commutator of these two is trivial, the neutral element, because exactly then these two expressions here are the same. So this is very important. The commutator measures if two elements commute. So if and only if the commutator is trivial, so the neutral element of G, the identity, then they commute. So if this subgroup here is non-trivial, it means there are elements that do not commute. Otherwise, they would all give me the identity. So in this sense, the larger this group here is, the further away we are from being abelian. Okay, now again comes the important concept of factoring something out or taking the quotient group. We just saw that the commutator subgroup measures how non-abelian the group is. So what would we expect if we factor this subgroup out? Well, the result, the quotient group, should be abelian. And indeed it is. And even more. This is the content of Proposition 25. As always, let G be a group. I do not bother to write that down all the time. The commutator subgroup of a group G is the smallest normal subgroup of G with abelian quotient group. This means two things. First, here in blue, it is a normal subgroup, so the commutator subgroup is normal in G, and it has abelian quotient group. So this factor group or quotient group here is abelian. abelian. This is the meaning of the blue underlined uh, stuff. And what does it mean to be the smallest normal subgroup with uh, such a property? Well, it means if I have another normal subgroup, N, such that g mod n is abelian, then it already must contain the commutator subgroup. So the commutator subgroup lies inside of n. This means being the smallest such subgroup. All right, let's take a look at the proof. And if you can understand this proof, then you have really gotten a good grasp of quotient groups, I would say. So first of all, we define, I could have done that before, but now it's really useful. Capital K is the set of all the commutators of the group G. 
So the commutator subgroup is nothing but the group generated by k, by definition. Take all the commutators and take the smallest subgroup that contains them. Now, to show that this is a normal subgroup, it suffices to show that this here is true for all elements of the group, so that if I conjugate k, I end up in k again. And then, by proposition 23, I know that the subgroup generated by this set here, this is merely uh, on the set theoretic level, k is not a group or need not be a group. But if this here is satisfied, then the smallest subgroup containing k is already a normal subgroup without any further ado. And here in this case it's very useful because we can avoid to look at all the finite products of element, elements of k and their inverses. So that saves us a lot of work. Okay, now we are going to prove this. And the proof contains a nice trick that is often used in group theory. So we take a look at this expression here. We take an element of this set, which is by definition a commutator xy, and we conjugate it with an arbitrary element of the group G. Now, by definition of commutators, this here is exactly that. And now we sneak in more Gs here in green. This is just the identity, this is the identity, and this is the identity. So surely I can put the identity wherever I want to without changing this expression. So I sneak in G inverse G here, here, and here. And now, of course, by associativity, I can set parentheses wherever I want to. So I take a look at the first three guys here, then the next three guys, then again and again. So I pair them like that. Now these here are obviously just the same as here. And now this here is nothing but the inverse of this element. Take a look at that. Why is that true? Because if you remember, if you take the inverse of a product, you have to switch the order. So to take the inverse of this here, I must switch the order of all three factors. And I start by taking the inverse of G inverse. But G inverse inverse is nothing but G. Then I take the inverse of X, the, the middle factor, which is X inverse. And then I end with the inverse of G, which is G inverse. So this here is exactly the same as this here. And the same goes for this last expression here. If that is not clear, please pause and go back. This is the key to this proof. If you calculate this inverse here, you end up exactly with that because of the switching of the orders. And now if you take a closer look at this, this is nothing but a commutator itself because we have one element, another element, then the inverse of the first element and the inverse of the second element here. So this here is nothing but this commutator. And being a commutator, it lies in the set K which is exactly what we wanted to prove. So the set K is closed under conjugation. And this means by this proposition that we didn't prove, but you can believe me, it's true. We can infer that the commutator subgroup, which is this here, is a normal subgroup of G. So this is the first part. We just proved that the commutator subgroup is indeed a normal subgroup. Now about the commutativity of the quotient group, we take two elements of the quotient group. And now for convenience, I use G prime as abbreviation for this expression here, because otherwise it would be very ugly to write that down. So any element of the quotient group G modulo G prime, this is the quotient I'm considering, is of this form. It's just a left coset with respect to G prime with any element X or any element Y. So I take this commutator and if I can prove that every such commutator is the identity of this factor group, which of course is the, the left coset of the identity, so G prime itself, then I know that this group is abelian because, I don't know if it's still on camera, 
this is what we said in the beginning. Or maybe I'll fade it in here. You can see this is exactly the meaning of the commutator being trivial. So we take a look at this commutator here. By definition, we are again in a group, only that the elements now look funny because they are left cosets. But do not forget we are in a group, G modulo G prime. So this commutator is this element times this element times the inverse of this element times the inverse of this element here. Now, by definition of the operation in the quotient group, this here is nothing but x, y, and then left coset with respect to g prime. The inverse of such a left coset is just the co uh, left coset of x inverse and the same here. And again, by definition of the operation in the quotient group, this here is nothing but the product of all these representatives and then taking the left coset with respect to g prime. But now here we have, this is nothing but the commutator of x, y. And now, the most important part, the commutator of x, y clearly is an element of g prime because it is the subgroup generated by all the commutators. And a left coset of an element in this subgroup here is just the subgroup itself as a left coset. All right? So that's why I said if you understand this proof, you have a pretty good grasp of factor groups, uh, quotient groups, and cosets. So, but as explained before, this here is nothing but the identity of this factor group here. So we have shown that indeed every commutator in this uh, quotient group here is trivial. It gives me the neutral element of the group. And this means exactly that the quotient group is abelian. And this concludes the proof of the first part of this proposition. Now for the second part, why this would be the smallest normal subgroup with abelian quotient. So let's take another normal subgroup such that the quotient is abelian. That again means exactly that every commutator is trivial. So every commutator of two elements of this factor group, these elements are exactly of the form xn and yn for arbitrary elements of the group G, must give me the identity of the factor group which is nothing but the left coset of the identity, so n itself. But as we have seen here by the same calculation, this commutator is nothing but the left coset of the commutator of x and y. But now, if this here is always the same as n, this means that this guy here must already be an element of n. Otherwise, these cosets would not be the same. But if this is true, for all elements of G. This means exactly that the whole set of commutators is a subset of N. And because every commutator of two arbitrary elements of G lies in N. So K is a subset of N. But that means that the subgroup generated by K, which is exactly the commutator subgroup, must already be a subgroup of N. Because by definition of the subgroup generated by a set, it is the smallest subgroup containing k. And here we see that n is a subgroup, it's, all, it's even a normal subgroup that contains k, so this must be true as well. And this concludes the proof of this important proposition about the commutator group. All right, I hope that was enjoyable. Thanks for listening. Bye bye.